Welcome to SelfDiscoveryMedia.com, where we discover the communities that are making a difference in the lives of others. Our self-discovery is something we are all making on our life's journey. Here you will find the people that will be your guidance, that will be your inspiration, that will be there for you in support on your journey of life. Do enjoy. Our next show is... Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of Eco Solutions right here on selfdiscoverymedia.com. I'm your host, Sarah Troy, and my wonderful guest today is Dr. Patrick Moore, the founder of Greenpeace, who is no longer with Greenpeace because he took a different journey. He's written a few books, and we're going to be talking about those today, but his latest book is Fake Invisible Catastrophes and Threats of Doom, 11 chapters exposing the many environmental scare stories repeated daily in the media in media. Um, he's the director of the CO2 coalition. Uh, he's been literally around the world. He's a wonderful resident right off here, right now here on Vancouver Island in Canada, British Columbia, and has spent his life dedicated to this planet, to our sustainability, but also to the facts and what we can do about it. It's all very well talking about it. As I said, actionism is the new activism. We don't want to talk about things anymore. We want to address what the problems are and find the solutions, get into actionism. But what are the facts? We know that media nowadays has its own interpretation. We also know that it sells on hysteria. The more you can put people into fear and wind them up and just give them one picture, the more they'll buy into that. But how do you look at the whole picture and to see what really is going on, what really is the truth, and what we really need to address? So let's ask him today and get right into it because this guy has a wonderful encyclopedia of knowledge that we're going to pick our way through today. Welcome, my dear, to the show. Thank you very much, Sarah. It's a pleasure to be with you. Now, uh, somebody who would look at the title of this book and go, but you're a founder of Greenpeace, that doesn't look like it would be in sync. But it's you're asking people to look at things from a different perspective, and uh, not through the media eyes or the hysterical eyes, but to know the facts. And we love to sensationalize things or jump on the bandwagon, but we don't always take the time to really look at the bigger picture, do we? No, and I have had a relatively long journey. Uh, mm -hmm. It began uh, from an environmental point of view in the late 1960s when the word ecology had not yet been printed in the popular press. No normal person even had heard of the word. Mm -hmm. Environmental was becoming a word that was being used more and more often. And indeed, I would say that the late 60s was the time of the emerging consciousness of the environment. And it wasn't long after that, in the early 70s, that Greenpeace was born in Vancouver, BC, against the US hydrogen bomb testing in Alaska. So I began in a time of great fear, fear of all out nuclear war and fear for the environment uh, being destroyed by human activity. And that's why I joined this little group called the Don't Make a Wave Committee uh, because of concern that the H-bomb would call it, cause a tidal wave in mm. the same way that the Alaska earthquake had not that many years previously. And it struck a chord here in BC that Here's the United States blowing off hydrogen bombs in a place that with the exception of Alaska was closer to Canada, Russia, and Japan than it was to the United States itself. Mm. And th that, that struck a nerve and we were peaceful. We're a fairly peace loving country. We haven't been at war uh, for I a long, long time. Oh, there's your rainbow. I'm afraid, <laughs> just a little excerpt for people watching the video. I did a Zoom baby shower with my daughter at the weekend and this keeps coming up and it won't disappear. So I don't know what, but there's a rainbow, rainbow of hope. So please continue. <laughs> I quite like it. <laughs> it will go away in a moment. <laughs> so so we, we started, uh, while I was doing my PhD in ecology, I had also been streamed in life science all through high school and into my first years in university, did a Bachelor of Science honors in biology and life science and then into ecology. And so I was, I guess, a rather serious young man mm -hmm. and uh, felt that I needed to do something about this uh, on, on the world stage. And that gave me the opportunity to do it, to sail on that boat for the first voyage of Greenpeace in 71. Uh, I came out of my PhD and stayed with Greenpeace for the next 15 years. Uh, it was a long evolution. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. We next we took on the French atmospheric nuclear tests in the South Pacific, for which France bombed and sank our boat later on in uh. the 80s. Rainbow Warrior, uh, under orders of President Mitterrand, and uh, then we went to save the whales, and that's when it really got interesting because. We had been focused on nuclear war and, and helping prevent the destruction of human civilization, which we realized would also be an environmental catastrophe. Mm -hmm. And so we put the two things together as green for the environment and peace for civilization. Hopefully civilization would be peaceful, that means. We and, hope. <laughs> we still yeah, so, <laughs> and, and so the Saving the Whales really put us on the map. Uh, I ended up becoming the leader of the organization during that period. And then in 1979, an out of court uh, settlement of a lawsuit caused by the American group trying to break away, which we had created, uh, for, resulted in the negotiation of the formation of Greenpeace International, of which I became one of five directors for the next six years. So it was, and, and in the final analysis, our main focus became toxic waste. Mm -hmm. uh, we in North America had passed water quality regulations and air quality regulations in the early 70s, but Britain and Europe had not. And even into the late 70s, early 80s, the rivers of Europe were poisoned. Mm. There were really almost no fish in them because of toxic discharge from factories. So we created the river boat, which was a smaller boat than the ones we've been using on the high seas. And we went up the rivers and plugged the pipes of factories underwater with divers and made a great success in the media of doing that. And as a result, uh, there's fish in all the big rivers of Europe today. So I, I personally see that as, even though it wasn't the most sensational, like the baby seal slaughter was the most sensational. Mm -hmm. uh, it just caught everybody's attention that baby seals were being clubbed while they were still nursing on their mothers. I know. Oh. And, and it, was a, it was an animal welfare, humane, it was a mm -hmm. humane issue more than it was an environmental issue in many ways, because there's plenty of seals. But uh, it wasn't like with whales, it was an endangered species issue. Mm -hmm. with, with the seals, it was like you wouldn't go out and shoot a spotted deer fawn still nursing on its mother so you could get its spotted skin for a wallet. You know, I mean, it, it was like that to yeah. us. And so, but the toxics campaign to me was in many ways the most important because uh, th th there was really a lot of air pollution and water pollution in, 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 into the 60s, in the 60s, 70s, and into the 80s. And we helped fix that. Unfortunately, as Greenpeace drifted along through the years, uh, where we started as a, with noble intentions as a band of volunteers, there was no salaries in the first five years of Greenpeace. And, and, and we stuck with it and, and, and scratched a living somehow as we did. Mm -hmm. uh, Pretty soon we were so successful that people were just sending us large envelopes full of money. Wonderful. And we ended up hiring people to do, to do real jobs uh, and fundraising was one of them and mm -hmm. soon became more important than too many things. Mm -hmm. And to meet the payroll every month. Uh, and then it kind of degenerated into making things up. And I left partly because Greenpeace dropped the piece and just had the green and began to characterize humans as the enemies of the earth, yeah. the enemies of nature, as if we were the only bad species. Mm -hmm. Like what other species is characterized as the enemy of the earth? None, not, not even mosquitoes or malaria or smallpox or you name it, uh, or crop pests, you know, we're worse than crop pests apparently. Mm -hmm. And- Well, there are not those moments. <laughs> 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 uh, have, there's not that many good things about them from our point of view. Right. They are living creatures. <laughs> but the point was, is that it, the first lesson of ecology is we're all coming from one font of life. Mm -hmm. Life began uh, and everything that lives today, people don't think about this. Every, every individual of life today represents a continuous, successful chain of reproduction from the beginning of life. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it would have been broken and we wouldn't be here if right. our parents didn't have children, for example, mm -hmm. right? That breaks that, that line. And so we're all on the same time front. It's not as people think that humans are a new species compared to, say, fish, mm -hmm. right? Which, which evolved many tens of millions of years before humans did. But no, we're actually all on the same time front. The fish kept evolving 
during that period too. It isn't as if fish became, you know, came 100 million years ago, and then all of us and never stopped evolving again. So we're all on the same time front. We're all here together, and life is all one. And that is the lesson of ecology: is, is all things on the earth, not just life, but the rocks and the air and yes, the water, yes. are all integrated, all integrated together. And when you think of how many things that is, every molecule of water, every atom of air, every rock and bit of soil, and every leaf on every tree, you have close to an infinity of things all interacting with each other. And I had been brought up in an agnostic family. We didn't talk about spiritual matters at the dinner table. Uh, we were a very practical country family, mm -hmm. and, but, but not religious, because there wasn't even a church in the village I grew up in nor police or a mayor. There's a tiny hamlet on the west coast of Vancouver Island named Winter Harbor. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I discovered the science of ecology, I realized that through science, which I had thought was just a, a very technical thing that you could measure anything and have a number, I realized that this science, ecology, was a science that you could actually gain an insight into the mystery of the universe and of nature through, through understanding how infinite all these, so you have, you have a nearly infinite number of things. How many interrelationships are there among yes. a nearly infinite number of things? Because they don't just relate one-on-one, -on -one, they relate to all the other things. Mm -hmm. And suddenly you have an exponential number of things going on. Uh, and you can't put that in a computer model. That's one lesson to learn mm -hmm. from knowing that. And so I, I became a born again ecologist is what you could describe it as and spent the next 15 years on the front lines of the movement right. until, until it came to humans are the enemies of the earth. Now that was an overarching philosophical point. So I did stay around for a while, even though many of my fellow directors were pushing that theme, none of whom had any formal science education, by the way. And that's when it came to a crux, when my fellow directors decided that Greenpeace should launch a campaign to ban chlorine worldwide. Now, chlorine is one of the constituents of a number of nasty uh, chemicals, including dioxin and DDT and PCBs. Those are all chlorinated hydrocarbons. And in fact, polyv polyvinyl chloride could be described as a chlorinated hydrocarbon as well. And so this, this led the, my fellow directors to think, oh, chlorine is the common denominator here. Let's just ban chlorine. Mm -hmm. Well, I said, you guys, first off, chlorine is one of the elements in the periodic table, you know, like one of the building blocks of the universe. So banning it is something you should, you know, consider carefully because you can't actually ban it. It's right. here and it's the 11th most common element in the Earth's crust. And not only that, though, that was kind of a joke, but... Uh, not only that, it is the most important element for public health and medicine. Right. The addition of chlorine to drinking water and pools, swimming pools and spas, ended water communicable uh, diseases mm -hmm. like cholera. And also, well, pretty near ended it. Uh, and, and also, 85% uh, of our pharmaceuticals are made with chlorine chemistry, and 25% of them actually have chlorine in them. If you look at your cold and flu, remedies, you will often see a little CL at the end of a chemical that's included in them. So I, that was too much of a pointy end on the stick for me. I, yeah. I had to leave. Right. I just had to go. So I did go. And when I went, I went hopefully that I could uh, take all I had learned all those years and turn it into what I called a sensible environmentalist, basing my position squarely on science and logic and not on misinformation, sensationalism, and fear, as is too often the case today. So yes. sorry for such a long-winded history, no. but it's 15 <laughs> years of my life. Yes, exactly. Um, fanaticism, you know, it's a, a good idea uh, that needs to be addressed, and if we apply this, we can do that. But when it suddenly starts building up into you know fanaticism it that's when we start losing the bigger picture as they say chlorine you know the the components of it that are bad for us yes let's ban those but there is a component that is good for us and that's necessary uh, for our well-being so it's like you know throwing the baby out with the bathwater it's there is no one label that suits all you and that's the thing about science even spirituality there are many layers to things and i find that 
media and uh, um, and a lot of activists out there, it's all about this is the picture, this is evil, this is what we're going to condemn without breaking it down into what is really necessary and what isn't. We, I think as human beings, we like to buy into that more than we do, you know, I, you've just mentioned a few things that I have no knowledge about because I'm not a scientist and some people will get it and some people won't. But why don't we ask the questions? Why don't we try and understand instead of constantly just buying into the hysteria and um, becoming fanatics of it without really understanding uh, what's really going on? And um, I think with your current book at the present moment, is that's what we're seeing a great deal of, isn't it? You know, the news loves to sell bad news. Um, but, yeah, but where is the where is the good part in it? Because nothing is ever completely evil or completely good. There are always shades. And if we had more information, we could make clearer choices and we could react in a more progressive way. But yes, you said you left Greenpeace because it became more about just black and white rather than really understanding what the real enemy was. Um, and that, you know, that fanatic type attitude towards things stirs people up, but it also stirs the hate. You know, before then, people are sending you money. They love what you're doing. You're doing good for the planet and for the people. And then it started getting more righteous and even violent. And it loses its message. And whatever message we want to get out there, we really do have to do it from a respectful point of way and even a peaceful point of view it may take longer but it will be more sure-footed yes and and you know one thing i said as as i learned the lessons there was you don't have to be a phd mm. in nuclear physics to oppose nuclear weapons and nuclear war right. you don't have to be a phd in marine biology to to save the whales right but when you start dealing with chemicals and mm -hmm. toxics in particular toxicology is not understood by most people because no. A substance isn't just toxic. It's only toxic at a certain level. And if you take many essential nutrients, let's just take say, table salt for a minute. That can happen, can't it, when you forget to put your phone on? <laughs> That's okay. It happens to all of let's us. Just take, let's just take table salt for a minute. And table salt is an essential nutrient, sodium chloride, NaCl. We have to have it or we die. But if you eat four to five tablespoons of it, that's all it takes yeah. to kill you. Mm -hmm. It becomes toxic at a certain level. In between where it's good for you and where it's bad for you is an area where it isn't going to be any better for you, but it isn't going to kill you yet. Mm -hmm. So it's a scale and yeah. it's not an absolute thing. Right. And saving the whales for us was an absolute thing. Yeah. Stopping nuclear war was an absolute thing. But there's a difference between campaigns for abolition versus campaigns for reform. Yeah. And that's where Greenpeace got lost. Yes. Is all they knew about was campaigns to stop things from happening dead in their tracks completely and forever, instead of realizing that sometimes like forestry or agriculture, for example, you can't abolish those two things. You have to work from reform, trying to improve the practices from an environmental point of view, from a nutritional point of view, or whatever it is you're looking at. And, and so that's, that's the stance I took on uh, having to leave a situation where they were saying we need a worldwide ban on chlorine. That was a campaign for abolition of something that has a thousand really good uses right. and is in fact itself an essential nutrient. Mm -hmm. yeah. life, has, life has chlorine in it. Mm -hmm. and, and if it wasn't there, we wouldn't be here. So. Uh, you, you just have to, to, to do that. So that's, that's the, and I've spent the next now, uh, what is this, 35 years going on, 36, I guess, uh, on that pathway of trying to understand things from an objective point of view and not to get into an emotional uh, state of mind about these things. And I think a lot of people are very emotional about these issues, especially when someone tells them the world is going to get too hot for life in 10 years mm -hmm. and, 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 and we're all going to fry uh, when there's actually absolutely no evidence of any such thing about to happen. Right. But it's being said in the media to millions and millions of people who don't know 
that they shouldn't believe it because it's being it's being said as if it's coming from credible sources, scientists and things yeah. like that. Well, you know, Armageddon movies, end of the world. You know, there's constantly about Armageddon movies, the world's going to end, let's go to another planet and screw that up instead. You know, you, you said the magic word, reform. We know we need to reform our practices. We know that we need to, to get rid of plastic in the oceans. We know that we need to be more, you know, eco and biofriendly. Um, we have become very opulent and very disregarding as human beings and very wasteful. And we certainly can change our practices. We most certainly can reform that. We can reform our energy, introducing more friendly, eco-friendly energies in there. But it's not, you know, as you said, the absolute, it's got to be done now or else, you know. Uh, some things have to be done gradually. There's the economic situation around it. There's, there's the issue, is it viable at this particular time? You can't just jump from one thing to the other. You can gradually go into changes. But again, we just don't seem to look at the logics of gradual um, and addressing the situation. We just go into, it's got to happen now or else. And maybe we could take a breath and just look at, yes, change is needed because we don't want the end of the world. We don't want this eight years to even be 80 years. But what can we do to reform? And it really does call on us to change our own practices, doesn't it? Yes, it does. But there's a need to recognize things which are impossible under the, cert the present circumstances or perhaps even due to physical laws. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but let's just take one, airplanes without fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. um, they're not going to be running on batteries. They tried nuclear propulsion for airplanes, but gave up before they even flew it because they knew it was, if it crashed, it would spread radiation all over the place for one thing. Right. And, and, and things like that. So uh, it's, it, it, it is, let me just give a one big picture thing. Civilization used to require 75% of its citizens to toil in agriculture. Mm -hmm. And it's still true in, 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 in Mali in Africa, where there is no mechanization. And I've been to Indonesia out in the country where there, the only mechanized thing I saw was a rototiller in the rice field. Everything else was being done by hand. This takes a huge amount of labor. It means girls don't go to school when, and boys get put on the farm when they're, when they're eight years old uh, to, as manual labor. Because in, in subsistence agriculture, many children are an asset. Mm -hmm. because they're for labor. Whereas in the city, children are a liability financially. Mm -hmm. There isn't really much that you need them for because everything is, is automated. And so what's happened over the years, the downside of mechanization, the good side of mechanization is that there's far less toil for many, many hundreds of millions of people. Right. The bad side of mechanization is that mechanization is now a majority of people live in artificial urban environments where they really don't have any understanding of where all their stuff is coming from. Right. It, at least they don't seem to because oh, don't care. It, it, it's, <laughs> been, it's been fairly easy for the uh, extreme side of environmental movement, which is much of it these days, to convince the city people that the people out in the country who are drilling and cutting and blasting and plowing and, what, and, and fishing and whatever they're doing are the enemies of the earth because they are destroying the world out there. When in fact, the only reason they're doing those things is to supply, supply the people in the cities with the food, energy, and materials they need to construct the city in the first place, mm -hmm. to operate the city, and then to feed themselves. So the people out on the farms who are using fossil fuels to run large machinery like tractors and combines and the huge trucks bringing 60 tons of food at a time at night into the cities, they're doing that so the people on the 30th floor won't starve to death. Right. And this is one of the big disconnects in our society today is I remember back in the day when the anti-forestry movement was really strong here in British Columbia. And one urban activist said, I'd like to take all the loggers and march them into the sea and drown them. Mm -hmm. In the press, that was, that was written in the press, right? The people who are providing wood for our homes and our, our magazines and all, and all the other things, our wood is still the most important uh, renewable energy resource in the world, second being hydroelectric energy, with wind and solar way down 
the scale from those two. But they are never even mentioned when people talk about renewable energy anymore. Yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, the, the most of the urban greens are opposed to burning wood. They are opposed to burning trash. They are opposed to burning fossil fuels. So they're basically opposed to combustion and fire, which was actually one of the fonts of human civilization was the control of, of, of fire. It started like hundreds of thousands of years mm -hmm. ago. And now you have an environmental movement that is effectively opposed to fire. I'd like to know which fire they think is okay. Maybe a bonfire in the backyard, uh, but certainly not large scale fire to produce energy uh, or, you know, or to produce wood for building. Uh, that's not fire, that's another. Wood is the, like the most versatile material we have in the whole world. And trees represent more than 90% of all the biomass on the planet. So having studied, having grown up in the forest industry in BC and studied it at university and now studied it all my life and knowing how important trees are, they're not just important for beauty or biodiversity or watershed or cleaning the air. They're also important as a resource for human civilization. And how do you balance those things? That is the question. Mm -hmm. Whereas now I see the Sierra Club in British Columbia has adopted the term industrial forestry because of course, industrial is bad. The word industry is used like a swear word all, mm -hmm. always. That's just industry doing that. You know, industry comes from industrious actually, mm -hmm. which means to work, to do something and, and maybe even work hard mm -hmm. at doing that to make, you know, to get bread on the table. And so industry has become a swear word and industrious forestry means the wrong kind of forestry, obviously. So we should go what? Back to hand tools and horses for our forest industry? Uh, what does that mean? So those are the kinds of conundrums I deal with. And it, it makes people annoyed when you start talking like that because they don't want to hear that sort of talk no. as a rule. But the, these no. are the real questions. Mm. If, if we want to stop using fossil fuels, the, the plan they have now to have net zero by 2050 in 30 years means we would have to build a new large nuclear plant every day for 30 years in the world. Every day. We're not building one per year hardly now, right. where the Chinese and Indians and Russians are. Uh, they're, they, are, they are going into it, but not in anything like that scale. And they are certainly not trying to replace all their fossil fuels with anything else but fossil fuels in those countries. No other countries have this kind of pipe dream that you could actually get to net zero in fossil fuels in 30 years. By, by what would, especially if you're also against hydroelectric and nuclear energy. Mm -hmm. Th these are the two other reliable large scale energy sources that are cost effective that could be applied to reduce fossil fuels. Not so much hydro because it's largely built out. Mm -hmm. uh, the hydroelectric is limited by topography and rainfall, two things. So even though Denmark is wet, it's flat. And even, and Saudi Arabia is both dry mm -hmm. and flat. So you can't really have hydroelectric in large parts of the world. Whereas Brazil has 80% hydroelectric, Norway has 90%, Canada has 60%. So some countries do have a, a significant amount of this renewable energy called hydro, which the Greens oppose. They're, they've been against three gorges and every other dam that's ever been built and they're trying to get them torn down. And in addition, nuclear energy, even though there's 440 nuclear plants operating worldwide completely safely, and only one nuclear plant ever caused death to, to people, and that was Chernobyl, which is a stupid design that will never be built again. The, the Russians built that behind the Iron Curtain, taking their plutonium weapons grade reactors and cookie cuttering them as power reactors. And they, they were a bad design. They had the potential to blow up, which that one did. Mm -hmm. The only other two accidents of note are Three Mile Island and Fukushima. They didn't blow up. There was, a hydro, there was hydrogen explosions at Fukushima, which could have easily been prevented. But that's another story. Mm -hmm. But they didn't cause any death from radiation, those two, mm. those two accidents. And, and that's definitely proven. 
despite you know people people some people say that 900,000 people died in Chernobyl it was actually slightly less than 60 mm. mostly mostly the people who were fighting the fire that raged for 10 days in the reactor core spew continuing to spew radiation into the atmosphere so but when you think of it less than 70 people have died from nuclear radiation accidents in 60 years and there's still 440 reactors operating every day it is about the safest electricity producing technology we have and yet people are opposed to it even though 1.6 million people die in roadway accidents mm -hmm. every year every year 1.6 million and people don't give up their cars and bicycles no or being a pedestrian right <laughs> right know? so we have to get our we have to get our perspective straight on these things and the truth is is that nuclear energy which is an absolutely proven technology and these plants can run for 80 years way longer than any fossil fuel plant can run because they don't have a big fire in them they have a nuclear reaction in them but they don't have hot flames burning the steel and everything inside a, a gas or a coal power plant they don't last anywhere near that time they're lucky to last 30 or 40 years so nuclear plants last twice as long so it, it's okay if they cost a bit more to build mm -hmm. and they can replace every stationary source of power needed in the world which means that nuclear plants could power every building on this planet which is 40 percent of the energy use in north america is buildings heating yes. cooling hot water appliances lighting right everything in a building is run by electricity or can be mm -hmm. but right now most things in buildings in the united states are run by by fossil fuels especially the lights from coal-fired power plants and the cooling the air conditioning is run largely by fossil fuels nuclear can take that all out as well as anything industrial in a factory that is stationary like for example the the electric arc furnace which recycles steel is a huge consumer of energy and so is mining in general yeah that can all be replaced all be replaced with nuclear electricity instead of fossil fuel electricity but it cannot be replaced with wind and solar energy first because they're intermittent and are just gone half the time more than half actually most of them don't work 30 percent of the time Mm. So you have to have something to back them up that is reliable. This is the argument about wind and solar is why would you pick something as your main source of energy that is unreliable? When engineers choose systems with backups, they choose the most reliable one as the main one, mm -hmm. not the least reliable one. Whereas we're thinking of building wind and solar with gas, gas powered backup or whatever, some other kind of backup that is actually reliable, but then you force it to shut down when the wind and solar is available. So it makes that less cost effective and, and intermittent. So they have to start up and shut down and start up and shut down when they could be running continuously yeah. and providing 24 hour power. So let's, let's, one of the most interesting things that nuclear power can do is to run all the trains and shipping. Every train can be electrified. Japan has done it. Europe has done it mostly. The United States, not so much. Other countries, too, not so much. They're still running diesel generator trains, whereas all trains could be electrified and all shipping could be electrified. That's where a lot of people would go, whoa, what are you talking about? Well, I'm talking about Russia with five nuclear-powered icebreakers, one of the most hostile environments in the world, and they're using nuclear propulsion for it because they have to be out there so long and mm. can't come back and get refueled so easily. And they don't have to be refueled because they can run for a year or more on one fuel, one fueling. So, and, and all, six countries have nuclear navies, submarines included. If a boat can go underwater with 90 nuclear warheads in it for three months, then every ship can be powered by a nuclear reactor. Yeah. It's, it's absolutely feasible. And so there, there is a lot we could do with nuclear. We could do more with nuclear to replace fossil fuels than with any other technology, bar none, and way more. Right. So it could take out 50%, not, maybe not in 30 years, because you have to build the things. You have to build whatever you're going to build, you have to build. And there's simply 
no way that we can get to net zero with wind and solar. It's, they're, now they're talking about the batteries. They're supposed to last for a week if the wind and solar disappears. It, that is not going to happen. And that, that's, that's a prediction, I know, because right. you don't know the future. Mm. But that's, that's what I would predict. So that's, that's a tip of the iceberg for me on energy and what's possible and what isn't possible. I think what people get scared of is the word nuclear. You know, when they hear nuclear, they think bombs, right? And so nuclear must be bad. And, and that's the extent of really the knowledge. Nuclear is bad. Um, and they don't know. I mean, what we don't hear in the news is, you know, people like yourself speaking to, to what is good and what is bad, what is beneficial, what is safe, what is friendly for the planet. We don't hear that because it seems to get suppressed. Um, and it, do, do the public not want to know? I think most public do, especially right now. You know, when you've got such a reaction from people on, you know, looking at wind and solar as being the, the option, nobody's talking about the nuclear, you know, in a way that we would comprehend, in a way that we would understand its benefits. We're getting suppressed on that. So people are reacting to what they're being told and we're not hearing it from a level playing field of this is good, that is good, this is, you know, you can do hydro in these countries because of the rain, you can't do it in that country, they've got to go with a different form of energy. Uh, and to understand that we need to look at our resources, there are some resources like coal, we could walk away from altogether. Fossil fuel, we, we you know, we can look at limiting it or making it more uh, environmental in, in its, um, I mean, it's scientific, I don't know how to actually even explain it, but, you know, less, less uh, pollutive uh, on the environment. But if we actually have somebody that can speak to us like yourself on understanding what the options are and that is, you know, one size doesn't necessarily fit every country or if it does, is there the economics in order to build it? I mean, you take some of the poorer countries that could really do with this energy in order to produce industry that could sustain the country. Um, where is somebody helping them with their energy? to be able to become sufficient enough to not be a poor country anymore. We need to understand all of this, but people aren't speaking to us in layman terms. All we're getting, as you said, is the hysteria media of, you know, this is bad, this is bad, and that's good, but we're not seeing, you know, all the moving parts and how it works. And we need to see more of that. Of course, in the last four years, anything scientific was completely and utterly suppressed in North America. But I think this is the time where we need to see people actually explain to us why we need to look at these other things, not looking at them as bad, not looking at them as detrimental, but looking at them as being generative of the energy that we need and at the same time being eco-friendly for the planet. The way I explain uh, nuclear, Sarah, in those terms where you say it's related to nuclear weapons, actually, I was fooled into that in the mm -hmm. early 70s myself as a science student. Mm -hmm. Nuclear energy should be lumped in with nuclear medicine, not with nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. no nobody thinks nuclear medicine is bad, and it's one of the most important aspects of our medicine, especially in diagnosis, but also in treatment. For both sides of the equation, it's used extensively. It is a beneficial use of nuclear uh, technology and so is nuclear energy. Mm -hmm. There are 440 plants operating around the world and there could be 4,000. Mm -hmm. And that would make a massive difference to the energy balance in the situation. But let me tell you why wind and solar just will not cut it. Because they are more expensive when they build wind and solar, they don't tell you how much the backup system costs, right. right? And the other problem with wind and solar is it is rife with crony capitalism and corruption. Mm. There are three categories. Tax credits, where you can build solar and wind and write them off against other things you're doing. So you don't pay taxes there either. Mm -hmm. So you get tax credits. You also get subsidies. You get a higher price than what the consumer thinks they're paying because the government is providing the top up. And third and most insidious are mandates. Juris political jurisdictions require their utilities to purchase 
renewable, well, just wind and solar, they don't count hydroelectric as renewable, to purchase renewable energy if it is available. And that means the other thing has to shut down mm. and make it less economic and make the wind and nuclear have a, have a monopoly in the market, even though they're costing more money than the one that could be running continuously. So these distortions to the market, and I mean, I'm not a hardcore free enterprise person. I understand that there has to be regulations mm -hmm. for safety, public safety, and for environmental reasons. I realize that. But when you say to make fossil fuels cleaner, we have made fossil fuels so much cleaner than they were even in the 1970s, and especially back in the 50s and 60s, mm -hmm. with catalytic converters on all our vehicles, with full-blown state-of-the-art technology pollution control on all our factories and power plants. The air is so much cleaner today than it was when I was young in Vancouver and in every other city in the world. China is even catching up on this now. Now you say, who's going to pay for it? The Chinese are happy to pay for building power plants in Africa, South America, South Asia, and all over the world, because they're going to make 10% on it. Mm. Right? So they're investing. They're investing. The United States has basically a law against investing in any fossil fuel infrastructure in the world, especially Africa. In the CO2 coalition, we just wrote a paper on this ridiculous situation of, of, of the World Bank refusing to fund any fossil fuel powered electricity projects in Africa. They're going in there with wind and solar, which is not conducive to the society, the technology level or anything there. Uh, the, 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 the Africans, only half of them have electricity and only a third of them have regular electricity. Mm -hmm. They are the poorest people in the world. Mm -hmm and they have the least amount of electricity. And we in the West are forcing more expensive electricity than even we are using on them. And the air pollution, even from a coal plant that hasn't got proper pollution control is better than burning wood indoors and dung indoors. The, the, the indoor smoke is the cause of the very high cause of the reason that African lives are shorter than ours are. Mm. indoor smoke it's a huge problem in the developing world because people don't even have chimneys in their houses they just burn yeah. wood and dung directly inside the house even charcoal has a lot of fumes mm -hmm. to it so when you look at the way in which the industrialized world is relating to the developing world china the, one of the reasons china is gaining so much strength geopolitically in this world is because they are willing to help willing to make these investments and to help these people lift themselves up out of the life that they were in before where so many people are living in abject poverty. The world is lifting itself up despite what we're doing, but right. we aren't helping. We aren't helping much. And a lot of the do-gooders going over there are just using it to fleece UN money anyways. So it's not a perfect world, No, but we could make, but we could make it better. Right. Um, you know, I had Kayla Brust here on um, where we talked about, you know, African countries not having the energy and, you know, why do we have poor countries today? We shouldn't have poor countries today, you know, it, by helping them sustain their own economy, by generate their own economy. We have a more enriched uh, country that then becomes, you know, part of the equation, you know, throughout the world. Uh, there still seems to be this, you know, rich and poor. And let's keep them poor because it makes us richer. Um, and, and, you know, the monopoly that we have on there. But, I, you know, it seems to me that when we look down on, every, on, on everything, it's political agenda and the, you know, like solar and like wind and like um, wind, who is behind the manufacturing of that? Are they, you know, being lobbied by, in, with the government to, make it their own energy that is the only one that's going to be out there and then you know brainwashing everyone to believe that is the only alternative because when you look peel back the layers there's generally politics involved and there's generally money that is behind it you know the, the power to have the monopoly and are you seeing that with the solar and the and the wind is that what's behind it that's exactly what is behind it you see 
so, solar and wind are basically a parasite on the larger economy from an economic point of view in the final analysis. A, a whole bunch of people pay more for their electricity and a few people get a mansion. That's what's happening with wind and solar. And the fact of the matter is, if you look at how wind, one, one of the propositions I've made, and not just tongue in cheek, is that all the mining and all the manufacturing and all the transport and all the construction of the wind and solar technology should have to be done with wind and solar generated energy. Mm -hmm. In other words, they should prove that they're able to produce more energy than they use. Right. Because all of the mining, and transport, and, 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 and manufacturing is mostly being done with fossil fuels to produce these wind farms and solar farms. Being done with fossil fuels. And north of 45 degrees, which is can all of Canada, it's impossible to get net energy from wind, from, from solar. Impossible. It, there just isn't enough sunshine here. Mm -hmm. so, and, and the U.S. Southeast, there's no wind or solar there that's viable. Right. Now, there, there are places where solar energy will produce a fair amount of power. But again, it's riding on the back of the fossil fuel economy. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, what's, that's what's creating it in the first place. And then they say, oh, look at this. We're producing all this power. Yeah, well, how much power did it take to build those things? And the, the, the nuclear and fossil fuels definitely pay for themselves in terms of energy produced against energy required to create them because they have been creating themselves mm. self-generating there's, there's a lot of, they're self-generating and they, and then they produce excess power on top of the power that was required to make them right so it, it, that's what a, a sustainability officer on long island in new york coined this term i guess as he said that the wind and solar are wealth destroying technologies in that they take more wealth out of the economy then they put back in it again. Mm -hmm. And yet there's these, there's people who, you know, people are going, yay, General Motors is gonna build electric cars. I just heard this advertised the other day. They're going big into electric cars. Well, they, they, they make that out as if that's some kind of virtue signal, you know, that we're gonna be the good guys now. The reason they're doing it is so that they don't have to pay so many carbon credits from their, from their high-end pickup trucks. Mm -hmm. So what they're gonna do is build solar energies and build electric cars and sell credits to the pickup trucks from their own cars instead of having to buy them from Elon Musk, mm -hmm. which is what's happening now. They're having to pay other electric car companies for the, car, for the uh, carbon credits or whatever. I don't still don't even understand what they are. They seem to be in the air somewhere. I, <laughs> I don't think they're a real thing, but uh, there is such a, there's words called carbon credits, right? And mm -hmm. what it looks like, I'm not quite sure. It's uh, what it does, what it is, uh, whose pocket is it going in? <laughs> it goes on a computer and then goes to another computer. <laughs> and then you've got carbon credits because I don't know what you did actually to get them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you built an electric car. I think that's what you did. And then you get money, extra money from the pickup truck people who are building V8 pickup trucks for all the good old boys down south of the border. I mean, you know, um, um, my daughter and son-in-law have an electric car and electric cars seem to make sense. Uh, you know, when we were in lockdown in March last year, LA finally had clear skies for the first time in many years because there weren't the cars out there. So there is a pollution aspect to it and there isn't anything wrong in going electric. But as you said, it's, it's where is that electricity being powered? How is that being powered to power the cars? Um, of course, in the cars, we're looking at battery, but it, we don't look further back, do we? I mean, the electric cars aren't a bad idea. No, but why, are, as you said, they're looking at not paying the carbon, whatever it is, whoever it goes to. Um, somebody's always going to benefit. Somebody's always cashing in. And are they cashing in at our expense? Uh, are we really being fed the, the truth? I think if any movement that we can do that can be more friendly to the planet, uh, because I do think Mother Earth is pretty pissed off with us right now. We're huge polluters, the only species that are such in a massive polluters, and we certainly need to clean up our act. But we all need energy. And it's where do we get that energy in a way that isn't going to be an environmental disaster, that isn't going to be a monopoly of one over the other or government over um, the people. Um, I'm very much a Tesla person and, you know, free energy. <laughs> I'd love to have seen that. 
but it's something that is logical and rational that we can believe in that is economical that is environmental and that has to be looked at at each country is what they have if you have sunshine all the way through then i suppose solar works for you if you're a very windy windy country maybe the wind turbines work for you but as you're saying this nuclear plants they would do it all and they would do it over a longer period of time and they're self-generating and so it seems to be a logical idea but why is it not being so embraced if people are behind this are wanting to make money why are they not looking at this as a money maker yeah because of the politics uh the, the anti-nuclear the movement the time? yes it's totally it's totally entrenched but you know the environmental movement used to be more or less against mining mm -hmm. I, I i don't know if you know uh elizabeth may uh, yes former head of of the Green Party in Canada here. Uh, I, she, she tweeted one day, I'm against the prosperity gold mine in British Columbia, which, you know, an $8 billion operation that she was against. I said, okay, Liz, that's fine. Can you tell me a mine in British Columbia that meets your standard for environmental uh, production, for environmental standard? No, no, no answer. Oh, and a couple of weeks later, how about Canada, Liz? Is there a mine in Canada that meets your standard for environmental performance? No answer. What about the world? I said sometime later. Is there a mine in the world that meets your standard? No answer. Will not provide a mine, any mine anywhere. And yet wind and solar provides nothing, re requires nothing but mining, mm. right? For all the metals and all the rare earths and all the concrete and everything else that's in them, they are the product of mining. Now, mm. surely they would say that they're in favor of the mining to build wind and solar energy infrastructure. But you know what? They just ignore that. Oh, that's over there in China or somewhere in Africa somewhere that they're doing that. We won't let them do that here, of course. You can't do that in Arizona. You can't do that in Ontario. You know, but you can do it in some other part of the world just fine and ship it over here and we'll build it. then we'll build it. And yeah, nobody turn will know a, them. A turn a blind eye to actually really where it comes from. Precisely. So knowing where every, ecology for me is really because I'm a resource ecologist, mm -hmm. which is not an animal ecologist. I mean, I know a ton about that side, too. But fundamentally, I'm a resource ecologist. And the job of a resource ecologist is to know where everything comes from mm -hmm. that comes into human society, into the, into the human realm. Where does it all come from? And then to know where it goes after we finished with it. Mm -hmm. Which brings me to the subject of plastic, which you mentioned earlier yes. on. Now, the issue of plastic is a very interesting one. First, it's important to recognize that plastic is almost all made from fossil fuels and that the war on plastic is a proxy war against fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. It's got nothing much to do with plastic, in fact. Plastic, this pandemic has taught us, even single-use plastic, maybe especially single-use plastic, is so important that the idea of being against single-use plastic is so silly. If you look at the healthcare industry and the gowns and caps and gloves and tubes and blood bags and everything else that's used and wall covering and floor covering, which is injected with antimicrobials, which no other plastic can be except for PVC, polyvinyl chloride, which is made from salt. That's where the chlorine in PVC comes from and natural gas two fairly benign substances are put together and make vinyl, which is made into polyvinyl, which is a, a polymer, a plastic. Now, plastic in the sea, let's get right into it. Plastic in the sea is thought of as almost evil. It's leaching toxins into the sea and into the creatures. That's why we package our food in it, isn't it? And, wrap our food in plastic wrap because it's toxic. Is that the reason why we wrap our food in it? No, the reason we wrap our food in it is because it is entirely sterile and neutral and non-toxic and protects our food from contamination and toxics. So plastic isn't toxic, period. It is neutral. Now, when a piece of plastic goes into the ocean, say a fishing float, one of those little round fishing floats goes mm -hmm. into the ocean, they were used on a net probably, and they got broken up in a storm and got loose into the sea. When they wash ashore, they are covered in pelagic barnacles, like covered in them. So the piece of plastic has actually done the same thing a piece of wood would do. I've been watching this because I've lived on the seashore all my life. 
and by the ocean, not just the seashore. And plastic actually is benign. It is neutral. It is not toxic. And many sea creatures, over a thousand species, use it as a habitat for laying their eggs on, for sitting on, for sit being in. And plastic is more versatile than wood this way because it has shapes like cups and bottles and cans and stuff. And so it can be used as a habitat, a shelter. Whereas there's not many pieces of wood that can be used that way because they're not in those kind of shapes. They're usually right. just a big pieces of wood. Wood has always been recognized as a floating reef in the sea, beneficial to marine ecology. And many, many species eat the food that's growing on the plastic and wood in the sea. So let's go on to Dr. Da 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 Sir David Attenborough on the, uh, on the breeding island of the Lezan albatross out in the middle of the ocean where no one ever goes. This is the remote part of invisible fake catastrophes and threats of doom because it's not just invisible, it's also remote like mm -hmm. polar bears and coral reefs. But let's use the albatross breeding ground for a minute. He's holding up a plastic bag, a clear plastic bag and saying this was found uh, to be in the stomach of an albatross chick because the mother mistook it for food. There's no evidence of any albatross feeding plastic bags to their chicks. There's no evidence showing a chick opening up with plastic bags in it. They don't feed plastic bags to their chicks. They feed solid pieces of plastic to their chicks. It's not being mistaken for food, but he says that. Mm -hmm. And he gives no other explanation for it and says it's killing them. The reason they're feeding plastic bits to their chicks is the same reason that land birds feed pebbles to their chicks as a digestive aid in their gizzard to grind up their food because birds don't have teeth and therefore cannot chew their food before they swallow it. That's why they have two stomachs, one like ours, which is acid-based to, to basically dissolve the food, soft food. But food that needs grinding and turning into something smaller before it can get out the other end is ground with hard bits of stuff. Now, traditionally, seabirds have used pumice, which is a floating rock. It's from undersea volcanoes but it's pretty rare. But when, it, when there is an undersea volcano, that's what they take as a, the primary thing. They also feed squids to their chicks and the squids retain the beaks in their gizzard to use as a hard object to digest their food. Pieces of wood have always been used and nuts, like an acorn sized nut would be put into their mouth to swallow. And they, they actually do it in batches when they, when they bring the hard objects back to feed for the gizzard, they don't have food with them. Mm. They're not mistaking those for food. They're not that stupid. Birds are, are re relatively intelligent. That's why they live all their lives and have continued to live and breed and live and breed for millions of years because they're not stupid. And so they feed this stuff to their chicks, which is used as a dead dash to bait. And the Smithsonian, Greenpeace and Attenborough all say they're mistaking it for food and it's killing their chicks. That's really, I'd say, evil because BBC promulgates it all over the world. Right. And everybody's being told this. So the fact of the matter is, in the only thing that is really wrong with plastic in the sea is things that catch fish after they've been thrown away. And that mainly includes fish nets. Commercial fishermen tend to throw away their fish nets, their, drift, their, their drag nets, after they full of holes, because they, they drag along the bottom in many cases and they get ripped up. So they just throw them overboard. If only there was an international educational program for fishermen and to give them a system where when they came back to the dock, they could put their net somewhere and it would be disposed of properly, that would solve 95% of any problem with plastic in the ocean. Otherwise, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch with CNN, my book, you'll see quotes CNN, as saying that the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is twice the size of Texas and three times the size of France. That is very large, mm -hmm. twice the size of Texas. Yes. You could see that from outer space. If it was there, you could see it from outer space. It isn't there. Not a speck of it is there. You can see the Hawaiian Islands from a satellite photo of the whole Pacific Ocean. 
And what they do in NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Organization, they, they take a picture every day so that somewhere it's not cloudy, mm -hmm. right? And then they make a composite at the end of the year showing the whole Pacific Ocean with no clouds. There is no Pacific garbage patch, mm. but it's remote, 2,000 miles away, and no one can see that it's not there, right? So they believe it, that it's there. The news media is telling them it's there every day. It's a lie. It isn't there. So when I'm, when I'm speaking and I show this photograph, people come up to me afterwards and saying, you shouldn't be da 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 And I say, well, what? They, you can see it isn't there. They say one person actually said, yes, but it's just the clear plastic. That's why you can't see it. <laughs> and, right. And I'm going like, yeah, sure. But the, the next plausible scenario was it's just under the surface. Mm -hmm. So you oh, yeah, can't see it. Each piece of plastic has a buoyancy compensation device on it, right? Like, no, it either floats or sinks generally. There's a very few things that don't float or sink in the ocean because they're usually either lighter or heavier than the water. And so that's not right. And if they finally come down to, oh, it's microplastic in the water column. Oh, it's invisible. I get it. It's invisible. And what's the microplastic going to harm? Oh, well, it'll leach toxics in the organism. As if it's as if your li the fish's liver is building up a pound of microplastic that can't get out or something. Well, the microplastic can't even get to the liver because your body passes through anything it can't digest. Your body doesn't take in things it can't digest. Your, your cell wall, your, your stomach, even a microplastic can't get in through your intestine unless your body wants it and breaks it down first and puts it in there, takes it in there actively. These are not like things that just happen. They are things that our body does on purpose. And so nature in all its wisdom, like almost all animals are a tube, right? Of one sort or other, where the food goes in one end and the waste comes out the other end. Nature in its wisdom made the in-hole smaller than the out-hole. That way you can't swallow anything that won't go out the other end, right? Which is what they're saying all the time that it'll plug up their intestines and that sort of thing. Well, if you look up in the Harvard Medical School uh, website and you look for bowel obstructions, you will not find a single case of something someone swallow, swallowed that they couldn't get back out of them the other end. Because they make your esophagus too small to swallow anything large enough, you'll choke to death before you can get anything down into your stomach that is too big to get out the other end. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is just, these are facts. And the fact of the matter is, is plastic in the ocean is a net positive in the same way that wood in the ocean is a net positive. It's not as if we should just be throwing it there willy-nilly. Right. That's what I'm saying. But driftwood comes down rivers when, when there's floods and torrents bringing whole forests down a river out into the sea. That ends up floating around out there for a long time. And if you go to the shores in British Columbia on the outer coast, you'll see a massive amount of driftwood has come in on the beach and is up, up on the high tide. But another massive amount of it is still floating around out in the ocean, providing habitat for many, many species of marine life. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about waste, um, because I think we have become a very wasteful society. And you know- the Good plan. Hmm? That's oh. a good idea. Let's talk <laughs> about um, How can we be more cognizant on, on our waste? I mean, does styrofoam break down in the water? I, you know, um, is it something that the, the sea life can use you know, as, as an incubator, what happens if that gets into the whales or the other bigger fish that they can't break down? Um, but it's just our waste. I mean, right now you walk along the street and you see masks just being thrown on the street. And it's A, the birds get it and the, the wire part, the, you know, the elastic part gets stuck on the birds and then they, you know, are dragging it around and it can be detrimental to them. It's also foul to throw your mask out there. But we are very, very wasteful creatures. Um, I interviewed one wonderful guy, uh, Pashang, out of um, Iraq. His entire dedication is to waste management. And waste management, you know, you talked about burning waste and people are anti-burning waste because of the fumes and this and that. How can we be more cognizant on, on our waste and disposal 
and uh, you know and what is a, a healthier way to dispose things that isn't going to consume more energy well two preliminary points do not throw your mask on the street exactly I would say <laughs> yeah. and, and secondly though and 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 more significant is separate litter from pollution mm. litter is just litter it isn't necessarily harming anything. Masks is different because the COVID right. thing, right? Could yes. have bacteria in it. Right. But just generally, a pot bottle thrown off the side of the road is just litter. Mm -hmm. It's not harming anything. Right. And, and it should be picked up and put it's away. Personal. People, I don't want litter beside my road either, but I know it's not pollution. And because pollution is poisonous. Right. Pollution causes harm. And so but let's get into the waste management, municipal solid waste, as it's often called, all our household garbage. The only thing we throw away in our kitchen, because we recycle all the paper, all the glass, all the plastic, all the bottles, all the cans and all that. The only thing left usually, usually is plastic film, thin plastic bags, uh, plastic wrap, of, mostly it's plastic. Well, why are we throwing that in a landfill? In, in Western Europe and Japan, and in a few places in the United States, like Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Long Island, and there are more, waste to energy is the solution to this. Mm. To stop waste from going into the environment as litter, and to stop waste from being wasted, we are wasting our waste. Right. right. And in Europe, in Western Europe in particular, the recycling and the waste to energy takes care of nearly 100% of their waste. Eastern Europe hasn't caught up quite yet. Lots, United States and Canada are hopeless. They're putting more than 50% of their waste in landfills. Yes. Landfills should basically be banned. There's no need for them except for a few things like that when you have a waste to energy plant, the, the, the pollution that is taken out of the exhaust by the technology comes down into a bucket that should be buried. Mm -hmm. It's a small amount, but you get electricity and heat from using the waste for energy. And if you go through the airport in Minneapolis, St. Paul, you will see that all the trash cans have waste to energy showing an electric plug and a fire, showing that they're turning the energy, the, the waste into electricity with, by burning it. And the, 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 in the same way that Japan and Western Europe have all their railroads electrified so that they're not burning fossil fuels to run their, well, well unless they're running coal fired fossil, fossil fuel plants, which some are. But France, for, now you take France, just coming back to the whole big picture of energy. France actually proves that nuclear is the way to go. They have 70% nuclear energy. They have half the C just a little over half, but about half the CO2 emissions per capita of Germany right next door. They both have high income standards. They're both industrialized, but France with its nuclear energy has just about half the same CO2 emissions as Germany. So if people want to reduce CO2, France proves that nuclear is the way to go because the wind and solar doesn't really do much, especially not if you back it up with a gas plant. Right. Right. And, and I'm, I'm, all, I'm not against fossil fuels being used for electricity myself, but I do believe for the conservation of fossil fuels, which are a finite resource, where it is cost effective and reasonable, feasible, we should be reducing our fossil fuel use, not because of CO2. I'm a director of the CO2 coalition. We all believe that CO2 is entirely beneficial to life, human and otherwise, on this earth that it's greening the earth, this is proven. In mm -hmm. satellite photos, there's a 35% increase in global biomass due to our CO2 emissions since 1950. This is a fact. There is no proof that the CO2 we are emitting has anything to do with the temperature, none whatsoever. That's why fake invisible, I actually coined the term fake science. Mm -hmm. I said, it's not only fake news, it's fake science. Mm -hmm. And that got me repeated quite a bit in the media because there is a lot of fake science going on right now. And one of those fake sciences is that wind and solar can actually make a dent in, 
fossil fuel use and emissions. Germany has been building massive build out of wind and solar. It hasn't really influenced their CO2 emissions much, not much at all. Yet they're going to shut down their eight remaining nuclear plants next year, or the, the I think maybe this year and next year is their is their promise that they're going to shut them down. When they shut down those nuclear plants, I promise you that their CO2 emissions will go up despite their wind and solar installations, because wind and solar has to be backed up, mm -hmm. and it has to be backed up by something that works all the time. And France is. If you just have to look at there's, there's you go to Wikipedia, there's a list of every country in the world and their per capita CO2 emissions. Right. Mali, Mali is down really low, but 80% of them are still working in subsistence agriculture and not really enjoying the kind of lifestyle that we do. And that's where I wonder what people are really thinking. Are they, are they thinking we should go back to an agrarian society mm. where, where what? You know, I, I, I don't know what they're thinking, but right. it doesn't sound very good to me, whatever it is that's going to come of this. <laughs> a few years so, ago, I was involved with a, an electric motor generator, um, a new technology, which was really quite brilliant, but it was the wrong timing. It was 2008, uh, wrong approach to it. You know, um, somebody that was going to financially back us ended up losing everything because of 2008 and it didn't manifest but at one point we were at the um the green party's general meeting you and voting in a new person this was 2007 at the Rhodes University here in Victoria and you know I remember a woman going on about she refuses to to drive and refuses to get into a car and I said well how did you get here today I came with somebody did that person have a car? Yes. Were you in the car? Yes. And I said, therefore, you traveled by car. Yes, but I didn't drive it. <laughs> I said, okay, try and explain the difference there to me. You know, and, you know, I think one of the words that we also don't look at is, you know, common sense. You know, if you don't understand, do your research to understand something before you condemn it, right? Get the facts and don't just get the facts from one avenue. You know, there's a lot of information out there. Go with something that, okay, if they're saying this is this is fake, what is fake about it? And if they're saying this is absolute, uh, well, why are they saying it's absolute? We need to be more inquiring, absolutely more inquiring. But also I think what we're in the common sense factor of it all too is um, we're not taking any responsibility ourselves for our own actions because we're we left point finger oh it's the politicians or it's the it's the oil companies it's this and that they're all to blame and we don't look back at ourselves and our own practices and how we can change them but i think we also look at the fact that all right you don't drive a car okay you hug a tree you're making a statement i understand that that's fine but don't be righteous about it you know, because then that's that fanaticism that comes into it. In the equation of energy, in the equation of waste, in the equation of lifestyle, uh, in the economics that each country has to have, we have to address it in each country, in each province even, of what can we do that is beneficial to the whole? And, it, and how can we get behind that is doing it right? Um, we love to buy into the disasters. That's why so many disaster movies are so popular. We loved to blow up the world and have to go to another universe because this, this is what seems to be something in our DNA that we love destruction. But when it comes to a solution and that solution doesn't concur with another point of view, we're quick to condemn that instead of looking at really where, where is it really at? How does it really benefit? And we really want this earth to be around for quite a number of generations. We have to change the way we think and whom we listen to and what we practice and the pressure we put on the politicians. Whose pocket are they in? Right? Who, why are they promoting so much of this uh, technology? Is that technology as clean as you tell it is? How much is it going to cost us on the other side of it? And I don't mean money. I mean, you know, by, as you said, it's got to be fueled by fossil fuel for the wind turbine. Change is needed, but the change is needed in the perception of what news we buy into 
and how much we're willing to explore what the options are. So if you want to be an activist, so fine, be an activist, but understand what it is you are complaining about before you get out there and complain so much about it. Uh, don't buy into this, what I call the CNN effect, taking a pimple and making it into a volcanic eruption, because there's generally an agenda behind that. And what is that agenda? Is it serving you? Or is it serving somebody else's pocket? So fossil, uh, you know, the fossil fuel, the nuclear plants, I've heard about them being absolutely great, but no, nobody else is talking about it. Nobody else is talking about the benefits of it. Everything that's being pushed at us is wind, is solar. Sounds absolutely fantastic, but nobody's talking about, you know, the other side of it. And so we have to have more conversation out there. And it has to be spoken in a way that layman can understand because not everybody is a scientist or understands all of that. Spoken to us in a way of how it affects our life. And when we understand that, then we can be more participants in pushing forward what is best for us. But as you said, as you've written in this book, you know, it's the fake science, the fake news. Have we been so conditioned to buying the fake that we don't know what the truth is anymore? And I think in many, many ways, that is the conditioning that we've ended up in of not believing what we see or hear anymore because it sounds so much better when it's sensationalized. And maybe that's the onus that we need to take on. Get the facts, stop buying into the, the CNN effect. Well, speaking of the CNN effect, Sarah, I remember during the Fukushima, Fukushima incident, and I, I, I call it an incident rather than a disaster because nobody died because of Fukushima. But the headline on CNN in the middle of that incident was, nuclear crisis deepens as bodies wash ashore. Like as if the 20,000 people that were killed by the tsunami mm. had something to do with the nuclear accident. Mm -hmm. Actually, the nuclear accident was caused by the tsunami because the Japanese built three, four nuclear reactors way too low to the sea, mm. way at too low an elevation. There was, the, the, the whole thing about Fukushima is not a comedy of errors, a tragedy of errors. Mm -hmm. And they, they made a huge amount of mistakes because they are in fact a fairly insular society and they didn't even learn anything from the other accidents that had happened previously. Uh, but I, I think what I'd like to say to listeners is how lucky I was in my second year of university in science to be offered a course in critical thinking for science majors from the arts faculty. And it was a philosophical take on how we should read things in Time Magazine and listen to things on CNN. And the first point that was made was that never believe an opening paragraph or headline that has the word may, might, or could in it. Because mm -hmm. it should say may or may not. Yes. Might or might not, could or could not. Because may, might, and could are not actually uh, statements of fact they are suppositions or uh, predictions. And they sound think, absolute. Yes, they do. And so everybody should just reread it with putting yep. the other side in. And the, the, the other thing though, that's most important is to just recognize how people are using words. Mm. Like how did the word progressive evolve from regressive? For example, <laughs> just a minor example. Mm -hmm. how, how, how do the way words evolved, and now we have this term transgender, right? Identifying as the opposite sex to what you really are. Doesn't that mean pretending you're a girl if you're actually a boy? Identifying as, where did that come from, right? My critical thinking says that was made up, mm -hmm. not from the beginning of language, but right now in this era, that was made up to rationalize what that person is doing. And when I see the Minister of Education, the, the Secretary of Education for the United States of America saying, this is it. Transgender boys should be allowed to compete with girls in sports. And that's not all this means, of course. I'm not against someone pretending they're a girl. I just wish people would realize that it's pretend, that it's not real from a biological point of view, yeah. actually from a science point of view. 
what is identify? That's a psychological thing, isn't it? That's, that's like virtue signaling, yeah. right? Virtue signaling doesn't really mean you've done anything good necessarily. It just means you're claiming to have, right? And Many claims, is, <laughs> claims is the key word in science. Mm -hmm. A claim is when you say something is true. Here's, here, and here's how it works in a world where you can actually observe and verify the claim. You're outside with your friend and he looks up and says, there's a flock of geese flying south for the winter. He has made three separate claims. One, a flock of geese. Yes, you look up and you see that is a flock of geese and you've seen geese before, so you know for sure. Secondly, that's south and that's the way they're going. So yes, that flock of geese is flying south and it's the fall, therefore winter is coming. So I know that a flock of geese is flying south through winter with my own eyes and my own senses. But when someone says CO2 is causing a radical reduction in the quality of French wines, for example, or any other, you know, one, I saw one pair of things on, on, on Twitter. One side it said, had a graphic saying, climate change is making pigs skinnier. And the other one, it said, climate change is making horses fatter, <laughs> right? This is how ridiculous a level it has sunk to. And yet no one can verify that with their eyes. If I, if I point over the other side of the bay where I am here and say, look what the CO2 is doing over there. It's making the world warmer over there. They can't see the CO2. They can't feel the CO2. It's colorless, odorless, tasteless, touchless, and invisible. So everybody, critical thinking, please, recognize when you're being told about something you can't verify yourself today. You cannot count the polar bears today. You cannot see the Great Barrier Reef's full extent today. It is bigger than Texas. You cannot see the CO2 doing anything because it's invisible, except we know that because CO2 is the main food for plants, that the reason the plants are growing faster due to the higher CO2 in the atmosphere is because of our emissions of CO2. We know that we are responsible for elevating the level of CO2 in the atmosphere from a level that had sunk to the lowest in the history of the earth mm. 20,000 years ago at the height of the last major glaciation, which was about the 45th major glaciation in the Pleistocene Ice Age. Everybody thinks that was the end of the Ice Age. No, it was not. This is about the 45th interglacial period during the Pleistocene Ice Age, which is 2.6 million years old. This can all be verified easily, even in Wikipedia. Right. You don't have to go to a refereed science journal to find out this stuff. So 2.6 million years, our Pleistocene Ice Age came after the, at the tail end of a 50 million year cooling period out of the Eocene thermal maximum, which occurred 15 million years after the dinosaur extinction. We're in one of the coolest periods in the Earth's history today, even in this slightly warmer Holocene interglacial period, which is probably coming to an end as the previous ones have come to an end after about 10 to 12,000 years, and this one's reaching its limit age. And so before that though, before that ice age happened, for 250 million years, it had been warmer. The last time it was this cold as it is today was 250 million years ago at the end of the last ice age which was the Karoo, K-A-R-O-O, -O, look it up. It was 100 million years long. It lasted from 350 million years ago to 250 million years ago. It's all been recorded in marine sediment analysis with isotopes, etc. It's very well accepted by anybody in geology and understanding the Earth's history in, in, in long-term ages. So it is colder now than it has been for 250 million years. Now let's look at carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide had reached the lowest peak in the history of life, not just 250 million years, but 3 billion years, Wow! just a little while ago. And the only reason it's come up since then is the earth warmed into this Holocene interglacial, which caused CO2 to gas out of the oceans. Most people know that cold water holds more gas than warm water. The opposite of the air, which is really interesting, warm air holds more liquid like mm -hmm. water vapor, than cold air does. It's the opposite in the ocean. Liquids hold more gas when they're cold. And when they warm up, they give it off. 
take a glass of water out of the fridge and put it on your counter. And you will see in a few minutes, little bubbles form on the inside of the glass. Mm -hmm. That's the gas coming out of the water. Put it back in the fridge and look in there half an hour later, all the bubbles are gone because the water has reabsorbed them. So through the glacial and interglacial periods, the oceans outgas CO2 when they warm and absorb more CO2 when they cool. And that's why CO2 follows temperature for, through the glacial periods. But it follows the temperature. The temperature is being affected by something else, which happens to be in pretty much perfect harmony today in the last million years. Milankovitch cycle of the eccentricity of the orbit of the Earth changing due to the gravity of Jupiter. And look up Milankovitch cycle. Milankovitch was a scientist in the 1920s who discovered these cycles, three of them. One of them's 100,000 years, that's the orbit. The other one is 42,000 years, that's the tilt of the Earth. It changes mm -hmm. like this, over 42,000 years. And the what's called the wobble of the tilt. The North Star won't always be the North Star. That's a 21,000 year cycle where every 21,000 years it will come back to the North Star being the one we call the North Star now, mm -hmm. but it'll change. So those cycles, the Milankovitch cycles are clearly tied in with the last 2.6 million years of the Pleistocene Ice Age. And that's one of the things we actually know. There are so many things we don't know yeah. about the history of Earth's climate, so many more than we do know, that it's wonderful that we least know a few. Right. But the whole thing about the whole thing about CO2 being the control knob for the Earth's temperature is fake science, made up. There is no historical evidence for it whatsoever. And just because in this last 150 years, CO2 has been going up due to our emissions and temperature has continued to go up from when it started 300 300 years ago at the peak of the last ice age middle called the little ice age it wasn't an ice age it was a cold period called called the little ice age 1700 it started warming again then it had cooled down from the medieval warm period when the vikings farmed southern greenland it was warm then too like it's getting now mm -hmm. and that wasn't caused by our co2 emissions right and the same with the, same with the roman warm period 2,000 years ago, was even warmer than it is today. In fact, the last 6,000 years have shown a net decline in global temperature, going up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. We're in an up right now. And it happens to correlate with our CO2s as both going up. But the historical record doesn't have any evidence of that. And you, you, to, to listen to the alarmists, you'd think the world started in 1850. Right. At the beginning of industrial beginning of the industrial era but no it didn't the world started 4.6 billion years ago and life started somewhere between 3 and 3.5 billion years ago and there's been a lot of history here we know it pretty well back half a billion years 500 million and co2 was 10 times higher then than it is now and has gradually declined so whereas temperature has gone through hot periods and ice ages hot periods and ice ages hot periods and ice ages so if you drew a line, it would be pretty straight because it mm. just has gone up and down right. over the last half billion years. Had CO2, a rhythm. CO2 with some perturbations has just gone down. It hasn't gone straight. It mm. hasn't just gone up and down. It's just gone down, especially for the last 150 million years because volcanoes are no longer putting enough new CO2 into the atmosphere to compensate for an amount that is being taken out by life and put into sediments, mainly in the sea. So mm -hmm. that gets more complicated. I've written papers on this. That is generally what's accepted amongst the, what are called skeptics, not deniers, please. We do not deny the existence of climate change in any way, shape or right. form. What we do, what we are skeptical about, oh, interesting point here. A skeptic, not just a climate skeptic, but any skeptic is someone who disagrees with your conclusions. So they're skeptical of your conclusions, but a heretic, say a climate heretic, not only disagrees with your conclusions, but disagrees with the assumptions that they are based on. In other words, the information you put into the computer model that gave you the conclusion. 
Right. Because every computer model has assumptions being feed into it. They're not a magic box, mm -hmm. and they certainly aren't a crystal ball, which is actually a mythical object. Climate models are not an oracle. They're not a prediction of the future. They are a mechanical device that takes your assumptions, and if you put an assumption that CO2 will automatically increase the temperature into your computer model, guess what? The output shows, the conclusion shows, that your assumption that CO2 warmed the Earth warmed the Earth. Mm -hmm. And that's how people should think about these things. Look at what people's assumptions are, not just what their conclusions are, because they're two different things. What do you see over the next 50 years of us going through on this planet, if we continue on the same road that we're on right now? Well, first, we won't continue on the same road that we're on now, and we never have, in a way, because, well, first off, we're not really on the road. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a metaphor. Uh, and, <laughs> and on the journey, on the journey. <laughs> yeah, this is one heck of a journey. And one I, heck of a journey. <laughs> I really am surprised at the turnaround that's happened in the world in the last little while, and the and the, the movement against free speech is possibly the most central thing that concerns me in all this. And mm -hmm. uh, and fake news, uh, mm -hmm. where, where the where I never thought the private sector would get control of the media. Uh, and through the media, it gets control of the public sector and, and democracy and our personal lives and everything else. So I, I say Orwell was only 34 years out, right? He, he, he said it 1986, mm -hmm. 84. He was only 36 years out, right? <laughs> Whatever it is. He wasn't out by far. Right. Not in the scheme of things, most certainly no, not. Not in the scheme of things. <laughs> and if this isn't an Orwellian and somewhat dystopian situation that we mm. seem to be generally heading in at the present moment. I don't know what is. Right. And, but I'm, I'm not afraid. And that's, I, I think people's fear of the world coming to an end is a projection of their own fear of death. Yeah. And I'm not afraid of death, even slightly. Mm -hmm. I've, I've been told not to worry about things that you can't do anything about for one thing. Right. And that, that would apply to death. And, Every living thing dies. And that's why when they say the Great Barrier Reef has died, right? Maybe some corals died, but they reproduce, the living ones reproduce mm -hmm. again. So extinction is one thing, but mass death is not extinction. Mm -hmm. Even if there is mass death. The, it's the recycle. Thing, <laughs> the thing with the coral reef was actually totally fabricated and made up. It never did have a mass death. Mm -hmm. It had some bleaching on 50% of the reefs in the north, right? They totally exaggerated that. And, and now they recognize that it's healthy, but no one would know it because so many media carried the death of the Great Barrier Reef. We could talk about Great Barrier Reefs. We could talk about polar bears, GMOs, nuclear energy, David Attenborough's other lie, which is that the walrus cliff jumped off a cliff because of climate change, when in fact a pack of polar bears was attacking them. <laughs> um, things like that. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a story that was picked up by 150 media outlets that Africa's baobab trees are dying at an unprecedented rate, subhead, and climate change may be to blame. There's that may word, right? And th there's no evidence whatsoever that Africa's baobab trees are dying at an unprecedented rate. They actually don't know how many trees there are. And if you don't have an inventory, right. and you don't know how many, and there's no record of how many are dying either. There was no data to go with this story. Right? But, but don't so you think you that that's what's, what's really happening in the world right now? I mean, you know, let, let's just face it, I'll say the word Trumpism has completely made any form of news skeptical. You know, it's like, can we really buy it? Is it just sensational? Is it just coming out of someone's mouth? Where is the science to back it? Where's the logic to back it? Where is, you know, um, the rationality to back it? And where uh, news ha seems to be something in the last maybe, even, I don't know, 20 years or more, but certainly in the last five years, completely, how can we even believe a word that we're seeing? And well, now you you've got social media too. You mean the effect of Trumpism or? Trumpism? Yeah, the effect of it. Well, and the absolute denial of science. So you, and, blame, you and, blame him for the fake news? Um, I think he's a shoot stirrer. And, uh, and people yeah, carry, yeah, you know, he, bought he, he into that. Bought into, he never bought into any of that stuff. No, but he, other people bought into it. No, no, he, never bought, he never bought into the fake news in the first place. How can you blame the person who didn't buy into it for the people who did? 
Um, okay, that's another story and another chapter altogether. But yeah. um, we have got to distrusting the media. Well, with good reason. Right, with good reason because of so much of the fake news and the sensationalism. And you, you, you know, whose agenda is it? And you, you look at it. You know, bad news sells. People prefer to listen to bad news than good news. And uh, they're all one upping each other. And the more sensationalism there is behind it, it doesn't matter if there's fact. You know, people have bought it because you have said it. And there is no fact behind it because we're too lazy or incompetent to actually look at what really is fact. You know, as long as it doesn't affect me, it's OK, mate. Everything is affecting you in one way or the other. And we should yes. be engaged and we should know more about it. No, you don't have to be a scientist. But if you disagree with something or you're skeptical over something, do a little research, listen to a few people, come to your own conclusion by what has been stated as fact to you. But we blindly, like sheeple, believe everything that we told. And how can we anymore? And, you know, never mind you know, media front, then we've got the social media stirring things up. And we've become this whole society that would rather believe bad news than good news. And so, you know, this is why I said to you in the next 50 years, I mean, for us to think that the earth isn't going to go through changes, we go through changes physically, emotionally, environmentally, you know, we go through all of the changes in our little minuscule lives. And you think the earth isn't going to go through changes and go through different stages? And yet we want to put the stages down to environmentalism. And I will, I will be the first one to say that, and to a certain point I do buy that, that I think that we need to be more cognitive of how we waste and how we purchase, because I think from a moral standpoint, we have put too much emphasis on what we have or what we think we should buy and need than paying attention to what really we, we already have. But I think the case point is, is before you condemn something, before you point fingers and before you buy into it, be willing to do some research and, and, and look at it from a clear head, from a different point of view before you condemn it. But the news doesn't do that. The news just gives you what is their agenda. And you always think, but who's behind them? Why are they saying this? Who's paying them to say it? What are they really trying to stir? What's the bottom line? Is? Well, we know we know the answer to those questions. Big tech is paying for it. They're paying for the politics and they're yes. paying for the news. And for, they're paying for the news. Uh, uh, this may be controversial to some people, but I thought it was a cute double entendre. Hope trumps fear. Mm -hmm. And the fact of the matter is, is that things won't just work out by themselves without us no. taking a hand. No. You, you can't just say, we'll just, we'll just watch and see what happens. Mm -hmm. But what hope does is it makes you think of what positive things you can do to bring about good changes in the world without getting all upset about things, but actually taking, taking a positive approach. We don't know the future, and we can make it better if we try to. Right. Fear, fear makes you cower and fail. And right now, I see it as make America great or make the world great versus a dark winter. Mm -hmm. I heard the dark winter mentioned at least twice by a certain individual. And I don't think that's a very good projection to put onto the present circumstance. Right. Because it's tough enough as it is. Yes. With what's going on now without predicting a dark winter. And you never heard that from the other guy. Mm -hmm. It was always about hope and making things better. And that it, it's not personal for me. I, 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 understand that how, I understand that every politician makes mistakes and every politician has weaknesses and every human being has weaknesses. Right. But you look for their strengths and in leadership, you want someone who gives hope for the future. You don't want someone who gives a dark, dismal uh, picture of what's going to happen in the world and I'm afraid that's what we're being fed now. You and know, I would say inspiration begets invitation. When you become inspirational in a hopeful way, and that whatever we need to face, we can do it together. What we need to do and what we need to change, we are willing to do it together. Then you're giving people that invitation to be engaged in the solution. Yes. And that that is in every single aspect of your life. So many people are living an outside life 
um, no responsibility or accountability or even uh, connectiveness to self because life is an inside out job and you've got to know who you are, why you are, what you're here to do, what is your gift, how are you meant to share it because you are part of the equation, you are part of the solution and if you are not willing to accept that responsibility of self uh, and the accountability of your own actions and what your participation is, then you become part of the problem. And you buy into all this theory because it's easier to do that than take any accountability or responsibility yourself. You are such a joy to speak with, Sarah. Uh, really, I, I, I'm really happy you invited me on to have this interchange with you because we've seen the world from different perspectives yes. as everybody has, but we're both part of the ecosystem. Yeah. And I think we both recognize the interactions that have to occur in order to move things forward in a positive way. Yeah. Uh, is sharing knowledge uh, and, and not calling people names mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 you know, and not, not stooping to the kind of thing that I see happening so much on Twitter, for example, that there's so much of it's just, just name calling. And I used to try to deal with it, but now I just block it. And try yeah. to, and, and just work with the people who I know I can work with in a constructive way towards thinking about the future. I agree with you. You know, I'm always saying pretty well on every show I do is seed what you want to grow, water it and nurture it. What you feed will grow. If you're going to feed as yes, plant discontent or conspiracy or hate rhetoric, that is what will grow. Put around you people that are like-souled, like-hearted, like-minded. Uh, you don't always agree, but each and one of you are, are an ingredient in the dish. And there is no, you know, steak and potatoes. No, it is about all the other spices of life. And each and every one of us is a part of that dish. We're part of that smoker's board. And we just need to step up and be a part of it. And you can agree to disagree without hating one another. Right. You can see something from a different point of view. I don't agree on that or I need to see more evidence on that. That is OK. But the moment we go into the righteous, you know, condemning and slicing and quartering, there is absolutely nothing out of that that is productive in moving us forward because hate begets hate. And, you know, as corny as it is, love begets love. So when we learn to love who we are, why we are and what we're doing, we learn to love in gratitude everything we have and we learn to look after it in a better way. That's a beautiful personal philosophy. I agree 100 percent. Tell us about your books because you've got more than one. Give us all of your books and how people can get hold of them and also how they can get hold of you. Well, my first book uh, in 94 went through three printings was titled Trees Are the Answer. It's out of print now because I've neglected to put it back into print. Oh, you need to put it back. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't an e-book. It was before the days of e-books. And I need to put it back and to update it. So I'm planning to do that. I have so many projects on my plate, but that's one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, trees Are the Answer is about looking at trees from all sides as the most important renewable resource in the world, the most beautiful habitat in the world, the biodiversity, the cleaning of the air and water and the so production of the soil. People think trees eat soil. No, trees are what make the soil mm -hmm. from the rocks. And so it's full of information. I've grow grown up in forests and trees and forestry. So that was my first book. My second book was Confessions of a Greenpeace Dropout, The Making of a Sensible Environmentalist, which took me five years to write. It's 350 pages the first half of which is my 15 year history and leading up to it in Greenpeace and all of our exploits. It's a rollicking good book in that it's about, you know, Eileen, my wife and I were invited to dinner with Brigitte Bardot in her Paris apartment <laughs> at one point and things like that all through it. Uh, we, we, we coined the word giggle room. The <laughs> giggle room is, is a fictitious place where you go so that you don't show the media how giggly you are about how, how you've just shown them up. Right. Uh, <laughs> shown up the bad guys. I mean. mm -hmm. so, so we had the giggle room and then it went sour from my point of view. Uh, and we were basically hijacked by the political left now that mm -hmm. we had money and fame. And we weren't political types. Right. We were environmentalists and not playing the power game. Mm -hmm. And that's what, that's what happened. And it, it kind of went south from there. Um, then this book, 
fake invisible catastrophes and threats of doom, which I believe, even though it's a smaller book, it's only 200 plus pages, but it has 350 serious references in it. If anybody wanted to read every reference in that book, they would know a lot. Right. And I've read every reference in that book. <laughs> and so that, that book is about the fact that nearly every scare story, and I'd like to hear somebody tell me one that isn't, based on something that's invisible, like carbon dioxide and radiation, or so remote, or in the future, where no one even knows about it yet, what's going to happen, but so remote, like polar bears and coral reefs in the present, that nobody can go and see them or count them or know for themselves whether they're being told the truth. And the fact of the matter is, it's the activists, the media, the politicians who are promising to save your grandchildren from certain death, and the scientists on serial government grants all have a serious stake in the game of you believing their scare story. Otherwise, the trillions that are involved will dry up. Mm -hmm. And so you can't trust them automatically right. to, to what they're saying. You must question what they're saying. And this book shows you how you can, because you'll come away from reading this book. If you have an objective mind, you'll come away realizing that this is true, that they are using things that you can't observe and verify for yourself. The basis of science and discovery and theories and hypotheses is first observation and then seeing it again over and over under the same circumstances, verification that it wasn't just a fluke when you saw it the first time. Then when you're convinced that you have found something that is real in terms of cause and effect, usually, you open it up to the rest of the credentialed scientists to replicate it. Replication is the cherry on the cake of science. If it can be replicated by someone else and they get the same answer you did, you are verging in on a discovery here mm -hmm. or a theory or a hypothesis in science. And if somebody just tells you this, this, and the other is going to destroy the world or extinct this species or whatever, and you know that you're, you're not actually looking out the window and seeing that with your own eyes, you can't just get in a rowboat and go and see whether that's happening or not. You've got to fly to the North Pole and spend two years up there circumnavigating it with a bunch of other people who are counting the polar bears. How many people can take that out of their lives? Mm -hmm. So always be skeptical of claims that you cannot verify with your own senses and your own knowledge, because that's what's happening in this world today. The fake news and the fake science are all based on narratives. They call them narratives. The word narrative should be reserved for works of fiction. Mm -hmm. The word narrative should not be used in science because it isn't used in science, except for now. They call it science when they make up a new narrative. But those are just stories. That's what a narrative is, is a storyline. Fairy tales would also be a good yeah. synonym for narrative. So we, we shouldn't let them invent new meanings for words all the time. But they love to do it, to twist the language in ways that it wasn't ever used before to create new concepts like how you identify. I identify as a tree stump. How would that be? Why can't I do that? You know, I identify as the boss of the whole world. The word identify as is not a legitimate concept. They have to do better than that. Mm -hmm. They have to say, I think I'm a girl or I'm pretending to be a girl, something like that. Or I feel like a girl. It's a they don't that, know how a girl feels because they're a boy. Right. Yeah. I mean, I've interviewed a transgender and everything. And on that side of it is that the physicality may be one thing, but the internal is another. Internal? You mean, the, the, the way they feel about themselves, the way... Yeah, not, the physical, not the physical internal. You're talking about thoughts. Well, I'm talking about the soul, the spirit, and the heart. So well, they, they do identify that because that's the way they feel, but the exterior of them is in another vessel. Yes, well, I could say that I am a kangaroo, seriously, and say that I feel like a kangaroo, seriously, and if I did, what would you say to me? You're not a kangaroo, or would you accept the fact that I identify as a kangaroo? If that is the way you identify and you truly do believe you're a, you're a kangaroo, I must honor the way you feel. The truly believe is the catch. It's That's not hurting anyone else and it's somebody's personal identification. It is but when you 
It is if they're competing in women's sports. Mm, that's it. Another, another story to go no, down. It's not, it's not another story. <laughs> it is part of this whole use of language issue that we have in our society. The, the, in, in the way that you can somehow make a riot into an insurrection, for example. And the word is adopted universally. Across, that was not a coup d'etat. That was not an attempt to overthrow the government. We know that for a fact, don't we? And yet they use the word insurrection and coup d'etat as if they believe it was. They know it wasn't, yet they pretend that they believe it was. That's what I'm talking about. That's why I use the kangaroo analogy, because this is what is being done to us. Women did not get the right to own property or to vote mm -hmm. until 100 years ago, and now one of their main rights taken away their right to compete as women in sports mm -hmm. is being taken away from them by the government of the United States right in an executive order by the president of the United States and I think that is a serious problem even though it's out of my uh, uh, you know I shouldn't even talk about this because you get heaps of dung on you for doing so right but I, I have my principle you know and, and I know that that words are being misused. It's part of the fake news, in fact, mm -hmm. the misuse of words. And it's not material. When you say they feel like, or they think they, you know, they think they are, their soul, their spirit, those are not material things. So you can say anything about them because they too are invisible. That's why there's so many quacks in this world telling you what you should eat and not eat and what pills you should take and what vegetables are going to poison your liver or how to flush your bowels properly or whatever. It's because you can't see what's going on inside yourself. It's all invisible what's happening inside yourself in your digestion and your nutrition and your nervous system and everything. So they can tell you any narrative they want. Look at the, look at the clickbait and how much of it is geared towards making you fear for your health and telling you all these stupid things about not to eat avocados. You know, I mean, it's all there for you to see. I know, you've, you've got one thing and you know, avocados are bad for you, then avocados are good for you. And I think really it comes yeah. down to is know thyself and you know what, what your body likes and what your body doesn't like and how it functions uh, best on. And you know, that again comes back to that personal responsibility. You know, yeah. what, what you put in is going to be your fuel for your body. And if it's fuel, fuel that's not good for you, you're not going to feel good. If it's fuel that is good for you, you're going to feel it. So, you know, let that be your proof rather than somebody else. And I, I mean, no, bananas are meant to be bad for you. Um, so there's always somebody that's saying something's going to be bad for you, but you need to decide that for yourself. I agree with that. But it's not as if we shouldn't look at nutrition as a science. Oh, God, no, definitely not. I mean, it has a huge thing to play as, as well as, you know, all the chemicals that are put in food today that are changing, you know, our whole chemistry in our bodies. Uh, um, yeah, there's a there's, there's huge amount of wrong in the world because we've bought into it. And again, is that we blindly buy into it without, uh, you know, really looking at is it is it really something that um, that is affecting me? You know, am I blindly going to accept what's being said or am I going to do a little bit of my own research? A lot of it is we don't want to do our own research. Yes, that's true. So many people just accept what they hear in the news and read in the papers. And uh, that's a lack of critical thinking or even a lack of concern for critical thinking. And people need to do more of it. Yeah. Especially and, in this day and age. And I also think, you know, one of the thing about the news and which we've seen more and more and more of in the last 20, 30 years is, you know, sensationalism sells. You know, it's um, how they can manipulate a story into being the worst uh, possible aspect of it. And we buy it. And so what does that say about us? If we, the, the, they're giving us news that we buy. So if we demand to have more fact, more truth, as boring as it may be, and it's not sensational, then are we going to stop listening to the news? What is it about us that we like everything to be so blown out of proportion and we rather believe the negative than any positive? I, I don't think it's true that we are driving the fake news. I think the fake news is driving us. Uh, when they don't, especially when they omit news purposely. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, you when, know, it's got to a point where we just don't believe that the news can ever give us the truth. 
Precisely, but that's their problem. I mean, that's their fault, not yeah. so much ours. If they were giving us the truth, I mean, there's so much wonderful about the world to tell people about nature. Yes. I mean, I'd watch nature shows for the rest of my life mm -hmm. because there's, there's, there's so much to watch and there's, there's so many great movies there's, and, and on the fiction side of things. Uh, there's, there's so much wonderful content. Yes. The only reason they're distorting reality is for political and financial gain. Mm -hmm. That's why they're doing it. And it's their fault, not ours. But we're buying. Well, we should, the, it's up to the government to straighten that out. Yeah, but we're buying. Supply and demand. If we stop buying, they have to stop supplying. Well, so, they are actually, the, the, the mainstream media viewerships are going down across the board. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and this the, is why podcasts are, are, are coming up, because people exactly. really want the time to listen to somebody's perspective that has some facts to back it up. And so this is why you're seeing a shift of where people are getting their knowledge from. Yeah, and, and with me, I mean, I get almost all my knowledge online now. Yeah. I, I do watch a few TV shows, and I watch a few movies and series, like uh, After the Afterlife with uh, oh, the British guy who started The Office, Gervais. Ricky. Yes, right. Gervais. Uh, I mean, that's worth watching. It's <laughs> and actually, another one on Netflix that you probably would enjoy is The Boy That Harnessed the Wind. Oh, uh, I'll remember that. Beautiful. True story uh, of a drought in Africa and uh, the government not supplying food, basically opting out of any responsibility. And this boy simply invented a device that created the wind that generated water so they could plant food and sustain themselves. I'll so, look for that, Sarah. Yeah, there's a lot of beautiful stories, of, again, out of necessity people will go, there has to be an answer. I'm willing to look for it. I'm willing to explore. I'm willing to experiment to find a solution to this problem. And I think that's when we always get the most creative solutions is out of that necessity. And I love movies like that. Wow, you are a wonderful person. And you're, I'm, 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 I can't, I, I certainly understand now after speaking with you for a good time, how you are able to get to so many people with your message. Oh, thank you. Uh, Ditto, right so back at you. It, it just makes sense um, because you, you make sense. Ah, oh, thank you. Uh, Hope so. <laughs> yeah, nobody, no, nobody makes sense 100% of the time. Yeah. I mean, our brains can't possibly know everything about this place. Right. And I'll admit there is a part, you know, of the conversation where, you know, you were talking out of my realm of understanding. So it's for me to understand what I can understand it and then speak to it in a way that others will understand it as well. So this is why I always call my shows layman shows, you know, speaking to the general public. But you've shown us and you've given us food for thought. You know, even if we're watching something that uh, the question mark comes into our mind and go, uh, should I buy into that? No, maybe I should do more research before I buy into that. And if that's all we've done today is have people question what's been sold to them, and have them willing to kind of maybe do a little more research on it, then hallelujah. Absolutely, and that is my principle too. I'm the same way. I would expect other people to, to be the same way I am in, in those terms. When I hear a new claim being made that I don't have verification of, I start to investigate. Yes. Because I'm, 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 I just have such a thirst for information mm -hmm. that I want to know, and, and too many people just Take, it, take the word of the media uh, when they should be investigating for themselves a little bit because there's a lot more than video games out there. <laughs> yes, most certainly is. And you know, this is another thing about life. It's to be lived. We are exploratory creatures. We should be in wonderment all the time and we've become complacent. And instead of researching and, and exploring what is, we've just accepted what we've been told. And that, that is something that is a detriment to ourselves. It's a detriment to our society and it stops us progressing forward. So live in a wondrous you know, way of exploration where you want to know. It doesn't mean you've got to go and study it or become a scientist or know every single thing there is to do out there, but know something that you can speak to 
that you could be eloquent on and believe in because that will spark interest in other people and, and have them investigate and explore themselves. Share yes. that energy forward. And the internet makes you infinitely more powerful at being able to do that. All you have to do is type a few words in and yes. up it comes. Yes. Up it comes. Yes. It, and it, again, I, it, it comes into, you know, it, it, common sense again is that who's written it for what agenda, Yes. right? So, you know, again, don't just carte blanche buy it. This is the thing is we've got to be accountable with our words, with our actions, with who we are, what, what our participation is in life, what our contribution is in life. We have to be responsible for that. So therefore, learn as much as you can through life so that you can bring that knowledge and wisdom and responsibility forward with you. So true. You know, take Wikipedia, for example, because it isn't black and white. Right. Wikipedia is fine for things that are not political or politically controversial. If you want to know about boron, for example, the element boron, look it up in Wikipedia. There's nothing political about it. Right. right? But if you want to know about a controversial political figure or a controversial environmental issue, don't use Wikipedia because they're <laughs> totally biased. Yeah. That you're not going to learn the truth there. You have to go to other sources. But if you, if you, if you, as I have, I've for the last 20 years developed. A just really fast ability to get on top of things and to say, no, that's not what I want. Put in different words and you eventually get to the place you want and you, you satisfy your curiosity uh, much more quickly than you could by going to a library in the old days. Right, exactly. It's at your fingertips. Oh, I've come back with my oh, rainbow yeah. here again. <laughs> so quickly you know, tell us. How is it doing that to your hair? Um, I don't know because it's a screen it's, behind, it's you know, and I don't know how to get rid of it. <laughs> so I keep getting this rainbow. I wish people listening to this aren't going to know what we're talking about, but I have a posting behind me here on on this uh, Zoom call with a rainbow and to do, and it's gone now, and it was to do with my daughter's baby shower, and it just oh, keeps popping up. Well, <laughs> my brother has one that makes your mouth go wide open like this and then shows a skeleton inside your face and all these things. And he just presses buttons and when you're on him. Pressing anything is coming up on its own. It's haunting me. <laughs> <laughs> Quickly tell us about the coalition organization and how people could be a part of that. The CO2 coalition is a group of, of just over 60 scientists, mostly in the issues that would have to do with climate. Uh, atmospheric physicists, for example, geologists, etc. Uh, some uh, space people, engineers, uh, space architects. Uh, the, the, there's a big group of ex astronauts mm. called the Right Climate Stuff who are skeptical of the science the, the, of the uh, you know climate change catastrophe, uh, and they're mostly very educated people. Uh, and then there are some economists. Uh, who understand all of this stuff about renewables and the, and, and the subsidies and the tax breaks and the mandates and all that, the structure of it and why it is actually happening. Because if it wasn't for the, the market distortions that are yeah. applied to wind and solar, they would not exist. Mm -hmm. They would never have happened if it wasn't for the market distortions. And, and they will rust in place is my motto about them. Uh, because once you pull those away for economic reasons, if that's what happens, or for if actually you wanted to actually be effective in reducing fossil fuels and CO2 emissions, you would go to nuclear energy. So maybe that will happen at some point. I don't know. It should it, happen. It all depends on who's in power when. Yes, it does. It all depends on who's being bought off. Not in the, not in the immediate future, let's put no. it that way. And, uh, you know, maybe our next generation, our younger generation are so much more savvy. Uh, they are, they're sponges of information. They seem to be so much more rational and logical and, uh, and really, you know, great actioners. And so I think um, we just need to not screw things up enough to, to be able to hand the, the baton over to them, which I think we're just going to see a lot more rationality because I think they're born already in a higher frequency of understanding. I certainly hope so. Mm, definitely. I'm going to be introducing you to a few people that I think you should know with the work they're doing as well, because that's also something we need to really look at, isn't it? We can, as an individual, stand for something, but we're so much better when we collaborate with others. 
Absolutely. And, and it doesn't matter if they're in a different arena, but if it's all, again, part of the, the canvas, then it's yes. very, very important to know. I'm wondering, Sarah, if I have your email. Yes, you do. And I'll give it to you afterwards. And for people who want to email me on any of these shows, it's info at selfdiscoverymedia.com and they can get hold of me there. But I will definitely contact you afterwards. Um, thank you so much for sharing with us. We've had a couple of hours of fantastic conversation, amazing information, most certainly a different look at everything because we've had so much emphasis on the other that we weren't getting the balance of another perspective of being able to look at things from differently. And I know some people that have been doctrined into the other side of it are going to listen to this and go, oh, no, no, I disagree. It must be that because the media tells us so. We're asking you to take the media out of the equation and to look at the scientific fact from scientists collectively around the world of what really is happening and think for yourselves. Don't be a puppet. And if you still believe that it's solar and wind, so be it. But it is please at least be open to the fact of what the facts really are and what really we can do in order to preserve our planet and life upon it. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Until next time, folks, remember it's up to you. If you want to see change, be the change, but please open your mind, open your heart, and then we can actually really get something done. Bye for now.